Hi and welcome to my channel. I'm a Norwegian historian and on this channel we are going to take a look at important historical events that changed or influenced history in important ways. So please subscribe and click the notification button so you don't miss when I upload a new video. The Assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin On November 4, 1995, Israel's Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin, attended a peace rally in support of the Oslo Accords at the Kings of Israel Square in Tel Aviv. Looking out on the crowd of more than 100,000 people, Rabin said, I always believed that most of the people want peace and are ready to take a risk for it. He was in a festive mood and even joined in the singing of Shir La Shalom, Song for Peace. The rally ended at 9.30 p.m. As Rabin walked down the city hall steps toward the open door of his car, Yigal Amir fired three shots at Rabin's back with a Beretta semi-automatic pistol. The third shot missed Rabin and slightly wounded security guard Yoram Rubin. Amir was immediately subdued by Rabin's bodyguards and arrested with the murder weapon. But what did this assassination mean and how did it influence history? After the assassination, Rabin was rushed to nearby Ichilov Hospital where he died on the operating table from blood loss and a punctured lung. He was 73 years old. In Rabin's pocket was a blood-stained sheet of paper with the lyrics to Tashir La Shalom, which referred to the impossibility of bringing a dead person back to life and the need for peace. As Amir was being taken away in a police car, he not only admitted to killing Rabin, he bragged about it. I think Yigal Amir, at that moment in the car, already believes that he was the instrument of God, that he was doing what God intended, journalist Dan Efron noted. And he believes this because he did something that really defied the odds. He managed to get close enough to Rabin to shoot him. He doesn't know yet that Rabin is dead, but he knows that he managed to get close enough to shoot him. Amir believed that he himself survived because he had done God's will and God had protected him. This was the first assassination of a prime minister in Israel's history and that fact, combined with the news that the killer was an Israeli Jew, shocked many Israelis. At the funeral of Rabin, many of the world leaders attended, and several gave memorable speeches, including Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak and Jordan's King Hussein. Many Israelis, particularly on the left, blamed the killing on the political climate in the country that had become radicalized by opposition to the peace agreement Rabin signed with Yasser Arafat. The debate became highly personal and inflammatory with Rabin, a former chief of staff of the IDF said, being accused of endangering Israel's security by the extreme right. Opponents of territorial compromise from the Likud party and other right-wing parties were vicious in their condemnation of the Labour Party leader. Some religious leaders also believed that withdrawal from Jewish land was heretical. The opposition to making a deal with Arafat, a man vilified for decades as a terrorist, was great. The depth of hostility was apparent at rallies organized to oppose the Oslo agreements, where protesters chanted, We'll get rid of Rabin with blood and fire, and even carried posters of Rabin dressed in a Nazi SS uniform and being the target in the crosshairs of a sniper. Rabin and other Labour Party officials accused Likud leader Benjamin Netanyahu of provoking violence by his rhetoric at and failure to denounce the extremists at rallies he attended. Netanyahu unsurprisingly denies this. Yigal Amir was the son of ultra-Orthodox Yemeni immigrants. He was a very religious 25-year-old law student at Bar Elon University, who strongly opposed Rabin's peace initiative. The advocates of the Oslo Agreement believed that making peace with the Palestinians would preserve Jewish lives, but three extremist rabbis from the West Bank actually wrote an opinion suggesting that Rabin could be killed because he, in their opinion, had betrayed the Jewish people. The extreme right-wing emir believed it was permissible to kill Rabin to what he saw as protecting the Jewish people. 
Apparently, Amir had gotten the idea for assassinating the Prime Minister when he saw Rabin at the wedding of a friend in Tel Aviv. He was surprised by the lax security that allowed him to get close to the Prime Minister. Amir only discussed his plans with his brother, Haggai, and a friend, but spoke openly about killing Rabin. Amir was on the radar of the Israeli intelligence service Shin Bet because of his radical views. But, the security service claimed that they were not aware of his strong feelings about Rabin, but said they were concerned with Amir's efforts to create an anti-Arab militia. This sounds like a very poor explanation. You were concerned about Amir's efforts to create an anti-Arab militia, but you were not aware of his strong feelings about the Prime Minister of Israel? Amir was tried and convicted of murdering Rabin in March 1996, he was sentenced to life in prison and an additional six years for injuring the security guard. Amir's brother Haggai was convicted for conspiracy to murder Rabin and planning attacks against Palestinians, as well as for various weapons charges. He was subsequently convicted in 2006 for threatening to have then-Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon killed, an additional time was added to his sentence. He was released from Ayalon Prison in Ramla on May 4, 2012, after serving 16 years. On March 28, 1996, the Shamgar Commission issued its final report into the assassination. It was very critical of Shin Bet for putting the prime minister at risk and ignoring threats to his life from Jewish extremists. Because security was surprisingly lax as the area around Rabin's car was supposed to be sealed off, but Amir and others could get inside the perimeter and close to the prime minister. Journalist Dan Efren said that Rabin also was somewhat cavalier about his personal security and often traveled with a small contingent of bodyguards. For some time, he did not travel in an armored car and he refused to wear a bulletproof vest. Shimon Peres became prime minister after the assassination. He called an election three months later and was expected to win easily because of sympathy for Rabin and the desire of Israelis to see Perez continue his legacy. However, in the weeks just before the election and Netanyahu's campaign based on so-called security must have seen as more compelling than Perez's commitment to the Oslo process, and the Likud leader narrowly won the premiership and stayed in power for 15 years, with only one short period out of office. So, what was the consequences of the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin? Well, the assassin basically got exactly what he supposedly wanted. He didn't achieve it all by himself, but was helped by the election win by Benjamin Netanyahu, who was completely against the Oslo Accord and its policies and therefore reversed what Yitzhak Rabin had started. The construction of Israeli settlements in Palestinian territories escalated dramatically, and as a consequence of that, also the hostilities between the two people. Not long after that, Yasser Arafat died and PLO lost its grip on power and was soon rivaled by Hamas. With the peace agreement in tatters, and an Israeli prime minister who had very different views than his predecessors, the conflict soon escalated again. Some people have speculated, especially in Israel, and I emphasize speculate here, that because of the poor security job done by Shin Bet, who were responsible for the prime minister's security, that some high-ranking people within that organization had something to do with it, or had pre-knowledge of the assassination. If so, it wouldn't be the first time an intelligence organization has had some part in a politically important murder. We have seen this with both Kennedy brothers, Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palm and many, many other political leaders, who had controversial policies that stirred strong feelings among the power elite and the political extreme in their country. And the Oslo Agreement was definitely something that divided Israel in a big way. And again, it was a supposedly lone, crazed gunman, like Lee Harvey Oswald, Christopher Pedersen, Sirhan Sirhan, John Wilkes Booth, and many more. No matter what the truth is, there is no doubt that the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin changed the course of history. 
It crushed the hopes of the Oslo Agreement, it inflamed the conflict between the two people once again, and I think historians will be discussing the what if, in this case, for many years to come. If you found this presentation interesting, please like, subscribe, and share this video. And I hope to see you in the next one.